Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, first of all, let me say thank you all for coming to this talk. And a larger thank you to the conference for having me here to speak to you. I very much appreciate the opportunity to come back to Visby and the Gutland Game Conference and enjoy this fantastic festival. Uh, my name is Richard Dansky. I'm going to be talking about uh, Charnel Houses of Europe, the Shoah, or more specifically, you can't make a game about that. Um, and going into the development process that led to a tabletop role-playing book about the Holocaust the elements that led to it getting made, and how the combination of setting and game and my personal experience led to that particular somewhat controversial book getting made. Now, uh, before we go any further, I want to throw a caveat or two out there. Uh, this was a very difficult presentation for me to put together for a lot of reasons. It's been a little while since this book was done, but it still remains an extremely emotional topic for me all these years later. And so you have my apologies if at any point it's a little rough. Uh, the other caveat I'll throw out there is, yes, there are pictures with humorous captions in here because, well, sometimes that's just how you deal with stuff. Okay, so we good to go? Excellent. You can't make a game about that, the development of Charnel Houses of Europe, the Shoah. So, true story time. Or one of the stories from the development that I can tell. Some of them I can't. But this is one of mine, so I'll share it with you, and it's not one that I've necessarily shared a lot. On October the 24th of 1996, at about 11.30 p.m., I was in the office at White Wolf Games. Um, it was actually my birthday, but, you know, that's what you do in tabletop, that's what you do in games. You work late, you work late, you work late. And at about 11.30, the fax machine, I want you to remember, this is the 90s, we had fax machines. They were important back then. They were cutting edge. Um, the fax machine started spitting something out, and because I was the only one dumb enough to still be in the office at that point, I went over to the fax machine to see what it was and see whose mailbox it should go into, and it was the first draft of the introduction to the book, Charnel Houses of Europe, the Shoah, uh, by Janet Berliner. And I took it off the fax machine, and I sat down, and I read it, and I broke down bawling. And that was one of two times during this project when I just completely lost it and started crying in the office. The other was when the art for the frontis came in. Uh, this is a piece by a man named Andrew Ritchie. Um, if you look very, very carefully at the original, uh, you can see that he's used whiteout to take the wings off the ferryman at the front. And it was just absolutely staggering to see this when it came in for the first time and on a certain level, it helped me realize the enormity of what we were doing with this project. The original of this piece hangs in my office at home now. I see it every time I go into and out of my office. It's a reminder of the work that was done and what that book might have meant. So, that being said, who am I and why am I telling you this? I'm Richard Dansky. I'm the Central Clancy Writer for Ubisoft. I'm the developer for Wraith the Oblivion. I developed a good chunk of the uh, tabletop line for White Wolf back in the day, and I am now the developer for the resurrected 20th anniversary edition. I have worked on over 130 tabletop RPG books, uh, which means it gets kind of awkward when my wife says, are we going to get rid of some of those RPG books? And I say, yes, we're just keeping the ones I worked on, and, well, <laughs> it's a lot of shelves. And the author of six novels and a short story collection, and I'm generally a cranky malcontent. So, yeah, here's a few of the shinier things that I've worked on. I like to think that it's a wide range of material, uh, but my roots really are in horror, and uh, I did my thesis on H.P. Lovecraft, and Wraith, The Oblivion, which was my first real big professional project, was a real labor of love for me. Um, these are my two most recent books, Vaporware, which is a novel about video game ghosts, and Snowbird Gothic, which is a short story collection, and that is enough said about them, because we are really here to talk about this. Charnel Houses of Europe, the Shoah. And this was a book that came out um, and incited a lot of controversy even before it hit the stands. The mere concept of it was something that a lot of people found alarming or objectionable or shocking or exciting. 
And in a lot of ways, it was something that had never been done before. And I did this book for a lot of different reasons, and some of those were conscious reasons, some of those were unconscious. A lot of it was a matter of being in the right place at the right time, and hopefully being the right person to do something. So here's some basic data on the book. Is it titled, Charnel Houses of Europe, the Shoah. It's published in spring of 1997. If you ask Amazon, they will say it came out in February. If you ask the uh, White Wolf Wikipedia, it says April or vice versa. Doesn't really matter. Um, it was started in spring of 1996 with a small writing team and a small art team. Uh, it was on the Black Dog Game Factory subline. We will get back to what Black Dog means in a minute. It was 128 pages which means it was roughly 80,000 words with the layout and borders that we had for Wraith the Oblivion projects. We got, give or take, 645 words per page. This varied based on how many chapters we had, how many characters we had, et cetera, et cetera, but this is a reasonable stab and I don't have the original files anymore to go back and throw them into Word and do a word count on. Um, production number was WW6903. The nine indicates it was Black Dog. Black Dog was the adults only line. The, we keep these behind the counter at the game store because if a small child sees this and shows it to their mother, there might be trouble. Um, so anything with a nine as its second digit in its code was something that was for adults only, and it was $15. It's what we called a setting book as opposed to a quote unquote splat book, which were new sets of powers. Um, or a core book, which were large, expensive, and generally hardcover. And yet, it was published two decades ago, and it is still part of the conversation today. Uh, there was an extra credits about it not too long ago. I don't know about you, but I'm a little frightened to see uh, that goatee that large, but never mind. Um, I would also point out they spelled my name wrong in the original version of the episode, so, so much for literary immortality there. Um, but uh, back in the day, the boundaries that were getting pushed in mainstream RPGs were a lot smaller, sort of the first steps on the road to where we are now. Um, I remember going to Origins, which is one of the big gaming conventions, and hearing uh, speeches from industry veterans who were befuddled at how many women were coming to the conference now. I remember outrage on an industry mailing list um, over the possibilities of using pronouns other than masculine third-person singular pronouns. Um, landscape has obviously changed. You take a look at a game like Train, but in the late 90s, we were at White Wolf considered out there for using female pronouns in RPG source books. And uh, I also want you to put that in context. Remember, we had fax machines and people were buying Goo Goo Dolls records like it was a good idea. <laughs> so uh, to tackle something like the Holocaust at that time place, to jump to material that, that was that taboo, when we were still arguing over whether the uh, third person genderless pronoun Thon is something that could ever be used in an RPG book um, on a mailing list, it was, it was an interesting time. Let's get some context on it first. So, White Wolf Game Studio. How many people here ever played a White Wolf game? How many of you played a White Wolf game but aren't willing to admit it now? Okay, slightly larger number. Uh, White Wolf Game Studios was uh, the creators of the World of Darkness setting, also Blood Pit and Street Fighter, the RPG, though they don't talk as much about those these days, uh, was number two in the tabletop market in the 90s, give or take. Uh, produced something like 65 books a year, by the standards of the time, already a little subversive. We had what was called a gothic punk setting. The idea was that you were playing monsters in the real world. You were hidden from normal human society, but there were these great secret movements and battles between vampires and werewolves and wizards and ghosts and changelings and whatnot going on. Uh, the style of play was much less about hack and slash and leveling up and taking treasure and much more about social interaction. And the company was known for a certain, shall we say, um, attitude. Uh, which is a nice way of saying we threw the best parties, but uh, there was also something beyond that in terms of the content that we were putting out there for people. Uh, we were described as uh, role-playing for liberal arts majors. So, does anybody up here know this guy? Is this guy actually in the audience? No? Okay, good. Um, but uh, yeah, we were being castigated in certain circles for, yeah, as I said, ruining the English language by getting experimental with our pronouns, um, by having emphasis on social interactions instead of just accruing giant dice pools. Not that you couldn't accrue giant dice pools if you wanted to. That was what uh, Justin Achille, the vampire developer, called 
Vampians, um, emphasizing non-traditional areas of the mainstream gaming experience like costuming for LARPs and all that sort of thing. Um, and by no means am I implying that we had spotless intent or that we were the white knights of the gaming industry or that we were on any sort of uh, magical crusade, but rather these were things that seemed like the right thing to do for us. And it was pushing a little bit outside the comfort zone of an industry that maybe had been a little bit hidebound and a little bit wrapped up in its traditions, such as they were. So, making the books. As I said, we did roughly 65 books a year, um, which means generating an awful lot of content. Uh, I was what was called the line developer, which was essentially a combination between creative director and managing editor for two game lines, a Wraith the Oblivion and Mind's Eye Theater. And part of being the developer was setting the schedule. And that meant said, determining which books were coming out, saying, okay, we're gonna do you know, a player's guide and we're gonna do an ex you know, a city book on Cleveland and we're going to do you know, a, a splat book for ghosts who like to rattle chains and things like that. And just sort of figuring out which books were needed, which ones were appropriate. And that meant figuring out who was going to write them, so we didn't all hire the same three writers and burn them out, not that that ever, ever happened. Um, we would uh, collaborate with our developers to make sure that we weren't all putting our big books at the same time, make sure that we weren't stepping on each other's toes. You had to do some big books, some small books, you had to stagger the schedule so all the big books weren't coming out together, and so on and so forth. And you also had management involvement, and that meant figuring out the year's crossover, and making sure you could do that, and getting sign off on your mix of books, and making sure that they were buying into the subject matter. That at no point management was gonna look at your schedule and say, um, we really don't want to do this one. And that really generally hadn't been a problem until I came along and suggested we do Charnel Houses of Europe. And I am told on good authority that when I pitched this book, the head of the studio literally fell out of his chair. I wasn't there, I can't vouch for it, but that's supposedly what happened. But to their credit, they said, go ahead, do it, let's see what happens. This is something that's worth doing. Let's talk a little bit about Wraith in particular, and as I said, it's about to get its 20th anniversary edition. Um, the summary line for Wraith really is, and I quote, you start out dead and it gets worse. Uh, you play a ghost, you have unfinished business in life, um, I believe tvtropes.com calls it the big gray book of depressing. Um, I came on board on the developer, as a developer in 1995, Jennifer Hartshorn, who had been the initial line developer um, after what had been a legendarily rough development process, um, had moved over to Vampire, creating an opening for me. I had done some freelance work. And uh, so I inherited a game that had been part of a creative tug of war, and that had a very, very, shall we say, grim sentiment at the heart of it. Um, there was a story that one of the central concepts in its conception was the phrase, and I quote, I want to make a game that would hurt people. Um, also was intended for an audience of, and I quote, gamers and non-gamers, which really narrowed it down. But, uh, Jen took that, synthesized it, did some really impressive work, did the first few books, and eventually handed it off uh, through some intermediate developers to me. And getting started on Wraith, um, I actually started, as I said, as a freelancer. Um, I was doing a graduate work in Boston, and I was hired to write for the book Haunts and then the Wraith Player's Guide. Um, and so I would actually take these uh, assignments and do them while I was proctoring fake SAT tests for the Princeton Review, um, generally sitting in a church in suburban Boston in furniture that was designed for nine-year-olds. And that focuses the creative process wonderfully, believe me. But uh, So I did some freelance, and then that drove them to think that I had the potential to t pick up the line and take over. And the first book that I did as a developer was actually on the black dog line. is called Spectres. Um, and it was about playing the bad guys. Spectres are the evil ghosts of the Wraith universe. Um, as I said, this was a black dog book, which meant the illustrations were, shall we say, somewhat graphic and kind of creepy. And, well, let's put it this way. Uh, my mother had a habit for a long time of going into game stores and bookstores and picking up Wraith books and walking around the store and saying, my son did this. 
And then one day she picked up a copy of Spectres, which had been moved from the back shelf to the front shelf, and picked it up and said, my son did that, and opened it up. And she put it back down, and she never did that again. <laughs> but uh, I was the developer on Wraith from um, those books through all the way to uh, Ends of Empire, which was the end of the line, with the exception of two books, uh, Wraith the Great War and World of Darkness Tokyo, both of which were done extremely well by Ed Hall. And so I oversaw the meta plot, I oversaw the majority of the books, and I had a big hand in setting sort of the tone and direction of the world once I took it over, particularly with the second edition of the game. So what was the game about? Well, it was about ghosts. You play a ghost. You have unfinished business, things that tie you to the real world. Um, you have human connections, people you still care about. There's memories and echoes of things you did. There's the hope of redemption. Um, and there's also this vast underworld you're now dealing with, and what's called the shadow, the voice of your other self um, whispering in your ear and trying to drag you down to what's called oblivion. So you begin to see why maybe working on Wraith started jogging the idea of working on a book on the show. So some of the key elements of the setting. Oblivion, which is the ultimate void. It wants to devour everything. Spectres, who are wraiths who've given into Oblivion, and they are the bad guys now. Soul forging, which is taking wraiths and hammering them into inanimate objects. Um, maelstroms, which are massive, massive storms that are spewed up from Oblivion and tear apart the fabric of the underworld. Shadows, like I said, your dark side. Harrowings, which are extended psychodramas that you fall into when your character takes too much damage. In most games, your character takes damage, you die, you go into a coma, whatever. In Wraith, you fell into the underworld and had your worst nightmares played out and you had to find a way to role play your way out of them. And Transcendence, which was the dim flickering light at the end of the tunnel, the little beacon saying, hey, maybe there's some hope, maybe there's a way out, maybe this is where you go to get yourself right with yourself, finish your unfinished business, get ready, move on. It was not a game for the easily frustrated or the faint of heart and involved an awful lot of trust. The shadow concept meant turning over your character sheet to someone else in your group. The harrowings meant um, trusting your fellow players to deal gently with your character's issues. And it could get very intense and it could get very personal. And here's a quote from the aforementioned tvtropes.com talking about it, and I think the key phrase there is that it falls under the category of, and I quote, crap sack world. And I quote, not only is this the world of darkness, but you're living, quote, in the darkest, grimmest, most hopeless place in it. Um, and it goes on for a very, very long time from there. Remember, this was my dream job, by the way, to work on this game, so just gonna put that out there. But uh, one of the things that I always hated about the simplistic version of Wraith was the uh, it's nothing but depressing angle. Um, when I went to do this, I had the disadvantage of having a relatively recent master's in English degree, and I had a slightly different perspective on ghosts. I mean, you had the modern super scary stuff, but you also had you know, classic ghost literature that I'd been exposed to doing my thesis on Lovecraft, folks like M.R. James and Oliver Onions and Algernon Blackwood and E.F. Benson. And there was also other literature that used the notion of the ghost to tell different stories. And uh, Our Town by Thornton Wilder uh, spoke to me in particular because it touched on those themes of loss and regret, which I thought were absolutely key to Wraith. Um, if you didn't have those things tying to the world, then you might as well be playing a high fantasy game. And that's something that stuck with me and that informed a lot of the choices that came later. So moving on to Black Dog. The Black Dog subline, as I said, um, that was the adults only line. The idea was to have a space where boundaries could get pushed, where we could go R instead of PG-13. After all, our business at White Wolf was making games about monsters. And we were trying in our own way to maybe move past that sort of antiseptic, okay, we kill the monster, they drop their loot, the corpse magically disappears, and it's as if you had no impact on the local ecosystem um, approach that you had from the classic dungeon crawl. Um, and it was an experiment, and I think it was a noble experiment, and it went in a lot of different directions. The, the freedom to go further, to push boundaries, went in all ways, some in quote-unquote high culture, some in quote-unquote low culture, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that as far as I'm concerned. 
And yes, with these books, um, here's a cross section of some of the ones that we did. Um, you will notice they all have rather grim covers. Um, we were dealing with that sort of stigma of won't somebody think of the children, the notion that games are just for children, this material was inappropriate. And to be honest with the material that we were working with, we needed to have the ability to be gross or sexy or whatever was necessary. If you're going to do a game where the antagonist is a festering corruption that's twisting all life into hideous monstrosities, it makes sense to have a book like Freak Legion, which is the one bottom center there, where you can go a little crazy with the monsters and really show that to best effect. Um, Spectres, as I mentioned, was the previous uh, Wraith entry in Black Dog. Um, it had been set up before I got there. Um, and it was Black Dog largely because you were playing the bad guy and we tried to get serious with the themes there. But uh, yeah, I know World of Darkness meant you were playing monsters, but Spectres, you were playing the really bad guys. And some of these books worked and some of these books didn't, but it was an initiative that I thought um, management did a good thing by supporting. And it was an opportunity to go a little different, to go outside the box, to try to push those boundaries that even in our sort of everyday work in this setting, this different setting, we were bouncing up against. And so eventually I was setting a schedule and I was asked, you know, what's your black dog book going to be this year? And I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it and then I thought about it some more and then I may have thought about it some more, and I decided, you know, if, if this is the sort of thing we're going to do, if this is a company that says Games for Mature Minds is its logo, if this is the sort of thing we are saying is our mission, then, yeah, we should do it. For realsies. And that brings us here. Um, I said 96, I was putting together a schedule for 97, I had a slot for a Black Dog game book, and I had certain opinions about what we were doing and what we could be doing with the freedom the Black Dog afforded us. So I uh, put my schedule together, and I thought about it, um, and I uh, kicked the idea around to a few people whose opinions I trusted, uh, who were industry pros, who had been working in the field a long time, who had done a lot of work that I respected and admired, and this is what they said. I'm not sure if there were literal crocodiles involved, but there might have been. Um, and the first reaction I got from everybody was, you can't make a game out of that. And again, we were all stuck in this place where the word game automatically meant something for kids. It meant that we were walled off for tackling serious content. And that is something that had been bothering me for a long time. And you know, part of this is because I was young and fresh out of grad school and full of righteous indignation and all that good stuff. Um, but I never understood why we couldn't use games. This was our medium. This was the field we worked in. This is you know, our, our novels, our film, our poetry, our whatever you want to call it. And it didn't seem to make any sense that we were somehow being walled off from things that we could be tackling, that we could be trying to do through this new approach of interactivity. And uh, that being said, it was never my intention to, and I quote, make a game out of the Holocaust. It was my intention to use the medium I worked in, and I will never be so arrogant as to use the word art form, uh, but the medium that I had at my disposal, the medium I thought I could best communicate in to talk about this material in a way I thought I could do it best. And yeah, there were a lot of reasons not to propose this thing. Um, it was bound to be controversial. There would be internet flame wars. We were already the place where everybody was spelling White Wolf Game Studio with a dollar sign instead of an S. Um, it was potentially job threatening. It was a lot easier to pump out safe material. And of course, you know, there's personal reasons not to put yourself out there. Um, you know, by doing this book, I was asking the company to put itself out there in a situation that could potentially backfire if I didn't do the book well and if the reception um, wasn't a good one. Uh, two, and this is going to sound horribly mercenary, but it was a consideration. Um, it was an economic question. Uh, Wraith didn't sell well by the standards of the world of darkness. Black Dog's books didn't sell well because they were walled off from the section of our audience that was under 18. Uh, setting books generally didn't sell well because they didn't have cool powers and things like that. And so this was sort of a potentially risky book to do regardless of the content. Um, and I was trying to combine all three of those uh, warning flags. You know, 
If I was just interested in sales, it would be a lot easier just to do splat books full of powers. They were short, they were cheap, and they sold well. And as I said, you know, this had the potential to blow up all sorts of perceptions about the company and create flame wars and all that other fun stuff. Um, we could get flamed heavily on Usenet. Okay, you can stop laughing now. That's what we had in those days, remember? Fax machines, Goo Goo Dolls, Usenet. All right. I'm going to keep hammering the Goo Goo Dolls until they come up here and stop me. <laughs> and then I had a moment of inspiration. Um, Art Spiegelman. Uh, this wasn't the first time that a medium had been deemed inappropriate for tackling the subject matter. Uh, the obvious reference was Art Spiegelman's mouse, which took the story of the Shoah, um, very personal version of the story, and put it in the medium of comics, which everybody knew were for kids, right? Uh, you can't talk about that stuff in comics. Um, alternately, hey, you're taking you know, this very serious material and putting it in a very frivolous medium, and that's belittling the material. Those are some of the arguments that were used. And I did some digging, and I found that this cycle had been repeated um, pretty much since people started wanting to create art and creative material about the show. Every new medium, uh, there was a media backlash, no, you can't talk about it in that medium, it's not appropriate, it's not, you know. And that happened for music, that happened for poetry, that happened for literature. Uh, with Mouse, it happened for comic books uh, or graphic novels. And so, true story here, um, while I was developing Charnel Houses of Europe, uh, Mr. Spiegelman came to Atlanta to give a talk and he gave his talk on Mouse. I attended it because, oh my God, Art Spiegelman was talking. And afterwards, there was a little bit of a reception and Q&A, and I went up to him and said, Mr. Spiegelman, I just want to say your work has been absolutely inspirational to me. I admire what you have done so much. Um, and just want to let you know that form, that inspiration that is taking is um, I'm going to do a tabletop role-playing supplement on the Shoah. And he looked at me. And he said, good luck. And that was the end of our conversation. Um, now, so that was sort of one reason to do it. You know, the fact that, you know, this was the medium that was there that I could work in, that I could tell the story in. And it made me, th you know, think that this was, this was maybe the right time and right place to push forward. Uh, another was sort of the existing landscape of that sort of subject material in American mainstream RPGs at the time. And uh, to be clear, I'm not here to denigrate anybody's work, just it was kind of a barren landscape for that sort of serious material, and particularly uh, Holocaust and World War II related stuff. Um, the most notorious one was Wings of the Valkyrie, which was a champion's module, um, which was basically City on the Edge of Forever from Star Trek, where you had to go back and um, essentially not let Hitler get killed uh, so, because if you did, then the Nazis would win and terrible things would happen. And so that was out there, and that caused a huge, 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 huge outcry. It was very controversial, and it sort of went away quickly. There was also a game called Reichstar, uh, which I discovered when we were cleaning out the White Wolf Game Library at one point, which posited that the uh, Nazis had won World War II and then gone off into space. And um, it was... An interesting game, but I didn't think it necessarily tackled the subject matter particularly well. And so that was pretty much what I could find out there. And yeah, like I said, maybe it didn't turn out so well. And once you get past that, you get into sort of the, the deep thicket um, with the urban legend about whether TSR tried to copyright the word Nazis. They didn't. And uh, Maybe the best way this was, a was tackled was in the Tales from the Floating Vagabond role-playing game where they very deliberately made Nazis an object of ridicule and mockery, uh, sort of the Werner Klemper approach from Hogan's Heroes. But at the same time, this may be presented an, an opportunity. There was you know, an open space here. And working on Wraith, which was sort of the Deep Space Nine of the World of Darkness. Uh, how many of you watched Deep Space Nine? Okay, how many of you are willing to admit that Deep Space Nine was not the cool Star Trek, right? It was the one that maybe didn't have the biggest ratings, it was the one that didn't have as many watchers, and that opened them up to do all sorts of really interesting storylines. If you go back and look at some of what they did, there's amazingly progressive and interesting stuff in there. And I took a little bit of... Uh, 
inspiration from that, saying, okay, here's this vast empty space, and Wraith is not the economic powerhouse that's driving the world of darkness. Um, Wraith is not the one that everybody's looking at, so maybe I have a little more creative freedom to try and do something a little different. I can take advantage of the fact that all eyes aren't quite on me and get a running start on this. And that felt liberating and it felt inspirational. But it still begs the question, uh, why tackle this material? Why did I think this format was a good one to do it in? And why did I think that I could or should do this? And this is an illustration from the book. You'll be seeing a few of those as we go further on. And here's where I ran smack into one of the central tenets of the world of darkness, which was the secret history, the idea that there were hidden powers in the shadows manipulating all of history for their benefit. Um, it started the very first Vampire the Masquerade book and the suggestion that everything from the Punic Wars to Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over the lantern and setting Chicago on fire was secretly caused by vampires. Uh, if you look at the splat books, you looked at the, uh, the back pages of the world of darkness and history is supposedly littered with famous people who are werewolves or vampires or changelings or mages or in the case of Rasputin, all of them at the same time. And um, important events that were always you know, cover for you know, this famous werewolf battle or these two vampires throwing down or things like that. And I realized that I couldn't really deal with that. Uh, the idea of having the Holocaust contextualized like that simply wasn't possible. I uh, couldn't shove the responsibility for what happened off onto some mythical monsters doing it for antiseptic reasons of realpolitik. It felt wrong. So I decided that there wasn't going to be any metahuman master plan behind this. It was gonna be something done by humans, to humans, for appallingly human reasons without any help for any, from any supernatural entities, and that we were the real monsters. And I think in a lot of ways that's what made things click, not just as an idea, but also making this a coherent part of the world of darkness, which this still had to be. Because monsters at least have an excuse, right? They're monsters. Um, people don't. And I realized, once I accepted that understanding, I had a real responsibility to the material. Um, so we were talking about not just hiding a piece of history, just cutting it out of the frame. Otherwise, you know, you look at a game like Wraith, which is about dead people and is full of dead people from all over history, and you're essentially saying to your audience, yes, yes, we have all the dead people from all of history, except for the ones that we're not going to talk about, la, 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 look over here. And uh, so shying away from this material was not going to be honest to the material and it wasn't going to be honest to the game and I felt I had an obligation to both. And yeah, I felt I had that obligation also to tell the story using the medium I had at my disposal because the alternative was, in a way, letting that medium sleep, sweep that story under the rug. And bearing in mind that you know this was a uh, younger me, shall we say, <laughs> Um, it was a story that I felt that I had the capability to tell respectfully and tell well. Um, it was something that through the education that I'd had um, and some personal connections that I could tell this story in a way that would be respectful to the material, that would transmit the material well, um, and that would hopefully communicate it in a way that the people who had inspired me on it um, would find appropriate. Uh, my sister, at the time she was working for Steven Spielberg for his Shoah Foundation, um, and what she was doing was she was coordinating the, uh, recording the testimony of Holocaust survivors and camp liberators. And every day she would go out and sit down with these people and get their stories so that they would be preserved for posterity. And this is what she was doing. And for one thing, it made a bad day at the office for me really sort of fit into context, you know. Oh darn, you know, the art department didn't particularly like my art notes. Well, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot, all things considered. But it also really inspired me, saying, okay, she was doing what she was doing to try and do something bigger, as it were, to preserve the story, to pass it on to future generations, using the medium that she had at her disposal, and you know, here I was, and maybe I should take the opportunity to do the same. And there's another inspiration, Janet Berliner. Um, 
She was an author who was working with the White Wolf's uh, fiction department at the time, and she'd done the Madagascar Manifesto trilogy, uh, co-authored with George Guthridge. It was an alternate history slash magical realism series uh, dealing with a different final solution that had one point been proposed, which was taking the Jews of Europe and moving them to Madagascar. And she had a family history with the events of the Holocaust. And originally, um, when I reached out to her, she was not going to do it. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that I previously elucidated, it was inappropriate to take this subject material and put it in the game. She wasn't convinced that White Wolf was the right company to do it because we had this you know, party animal attitude, et cetera, et cetera. And then she thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And she came back and said she would. And her intro to the book, Mia Gid Libanim, uh, Who Will Tell the Children, lays out why. And she says, um, you don't teach people only where you want to teach them. You teach them where they'll listen, where you'll learn. And so it behooves us to look for new ways to tell the story, to look for new places where the story will be listened to, where it will be heard. And so it is only the, the right and appropriate thing to do to take that step. And all that being said, I had to lay out some very strict project parameters. And we were gonna do this, we had to do this right. We had to draw some lines in the sand. We were making a resource, not a polemic. This was not a his intended to be a history book. It still had to fit within the context of the, uh, the game that was its reason for being. Uh, we had to make sure the point was getting across. We were not trivializing material. We were not drowning it in stats. Uh, we couldn't do absolutely everything. We had 128 pages to work with. So it was a question of picking and choosing iconic moments and things that would be representational and hopefully inspiring other people to uh, pick up and go on from there once they had finished with, with the book. We had a clear separation of real and fictional material so nobody could think that we were trying to uh, blend or blur the lines, focused on the consequences rather than doing a replay, and we always tried it to do right by the material. And, but it was not, it was not about fixing it. Uh, it was not about an inglorious bastards kind of scenario where we were uh, going back to rewrite history. Um, it's not doing it as a game, there's no victory conditions, no making it better. It was not about being victims or replaying it or rewriting history. Um, it was about consequences. It was set in the modern day, and it looked at the consequences, what it meant um, in the real world, and then extrapolating that to what it meant in Wraith and using that as a lens for looking back at what had gone on. And that was something that was very carefully workshopped and discussed um, with the art department, with layout, with everybody at the company to make sure that we were all on the same page about doing this. Again, uh, to try and all make sure we were doing this right. We had an excellent project team, um, three writers, Janet aforementioned, Robert Hatch, and Jonathan Black, which is the pen name for Mark Senzik. Um, we had three artists, Andrew Ritchie, George Pratt, and Larry McDougall. We had Matt Milberger, who did an exceptional job on the layout. Ronnie Redner uh, did a wonderful job of the editing, and uh, Larry Friedman did the maps. And all these people very fiercely believed in the project. All these people were excited to do it, and all these people really gave their all once they were on board with it to make this something special and remarkable and, and do the job right. And then what happened? Well, there's some stuff I can't talk about because some of those stories aren't mine. Uh, the people I just mentioned did some amazing work. Uh, book development is generally a long and boring process, so I won't go into the details of that. Um, there were, of course, eruptions on the internet. There were a lot of people saying, uh, White Wolf can't do this book. There were a lot of people saying, this book shouldn't be done by anybody. And what I did, uh, because I understood why people would have reservations, why people would be upset, um, and if, you know, to be honest, if I had heard that somebody else was doing this, I would want to be very cautious about it as well. Um, I reached out to everybody I could who was being particularly uh, energetic in their responses. And it didn't work so well with the guy who compared the book to Mein Kampf, but with a lot of folks, what I would do is I'd send them an email, I'd say, look, I'm happy to talk to you about this, try and get you to understand what we're trying to do, and hopefully this will assuage some of your fears. I would send them portions of the book, I would send them some of the art, I would invite them for follow-up conversations, and in many, many, many cases, uh, what that did was it opened some dialogues and got us to a good place where people 
had their fears um, assuaged and they saw what we were trying to do with the book and um, I think we got to a better place with that. And I also got a legendary phone call that I'm not going to talk about here because I've told that story too many times. But suffice to say that uh, support came from some unexpected quarters for this book. And then it came out. And the reviews, by and large, were exceptionally good. Um, Inquest said it may be the most worth, worthwhile supplement you can purchase. Um, and I was more pleased, you know, even with the scores, than to see that people understood or uh, had a sense of what we were trying to accomplish with it and communicated that in the reviews. Um, so the reviews were almost universally positive with one notable exception. Um, but what was much more important than that was the personal response to the book when it came out. And my email overflowed with folks writing into saying, um, I never knew this, or I learned so much from this book, or thank you for, for doing this book because it taught me a lot. And people saying that it inspired them to go out and find out more on their own. And that was really all I could, all I could hope for. And bear in mind, the intent was never to be a textbook. It always had to be a wraith book, but if people could learn from my contextualizing this material, from my telling the story within the framework of wraith, well, I thought that was kind of important. So, true story number two. Now, is it really number two? Have I lost count here? But, uh, I was talking a little while ago with a friend and talking about all the, the late nights and long hours and everything else that we put in a white wolf and from, from my jaded now video game developer for over a decade perspective about you know whether it was worth it and I said to her you know I guess uh, we thought what we were doing was important she said to me you know to a lot of us it really was and that made me think a lot and it was kind of humbling and the fact that I'm here talking about this means that maybe it meant a little more than I could have imagined when I first sat down to sketch well, any of it out, but this book in particular. And I can honestly tell you that I never imagined anything greater for it. I just wanted to do the book and do it right. I am honored and humbled that it still resonates with people, that people are still talking about it, that you thought it was worthwhile to invite me here to talk about it. Um, I know the book wasn't perfect, but I am proud of the intent and of the effort and of the work. And I would certainly never say that it kicked open doors for other projects, but I'd like to think that it opened up the discussion a little further. I'd like to say to push the boundaries out, that it opened up new territories, that it planted the seed in people's minds that maybe they could do something that was you know, a little different too, that it was something that people could point to to support their arguments when they wanted to try to push their own boundaries. And the lessons that I learned on this book they're going to inform my work on Wraith 20. Everything else I do as I going forward, go forward, absolutely. Um, to be honest, the book, Trinal Houses, was the beginning of the end of my time at White Wolf because once you do that book, what else do you really have to say? Um, it's kind of hard to go back to writing another storytelling chapter after that. But I took the lessons and I took what I learned and what the people who bought the book and read the book had taught me forward, and I like to think that it has informed the material that I have done and that I'm continuing to do. And so, thank you all very much for listening. I hope it was worth your time. Uh, please feel free to contact me on Twitter at Ardansky, and uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thanks for not leaving me hanging, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I, I can't not ask questions, so... Um, ask away. Um, I haven't uh, read anything that you've written, I don't think, but from this presentation, uh, it's, quite, it's extremely impressive what you did in uh, creating this, well, contextualization of a horrible thing from history. Um, but I'm <laughs> like popular culture, like in video games that deal in World War II specifically, 
they never go to the same extent when uh, like showing these sides. Uh, like I can think of any World War II mainstream game where you go to a concentration camp. Uh, maybe I haven't. Maybe you do in one, but I I don't know one. Uh, how do you f do you feel frustrated that not enough people have uh, like followed your lead? and decided to actually try to explore these really horrible parts that actually happened? Um, I wouldn't say, you know, I would never worry about anybody following my lead because I don't think I lead and it was never my intention to lead. Um, if you look at the old I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream video game, there was actually a concentration camp segment in there. And while you know, I would love to see more exploration of the topic you know, in this new medium that I'm working in. I am heartened by all of the directions that we are pushing the boundaries in. Um, from Gone Home, Papers, Please, all, all of the games that are pushing onto topics that somebody would have said, no, you can't make a game about that, about you know, once upon a time. So, you know, by all means, let's all keep pushing and see where it takes us. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any hate from any Goo Goo Dolls fans? Okay, well thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>